Hello, everyone. I'm Ariana King. I'm the marketing coordinator here at Meetup. Welcome to another Meetup live event. This is our 15th installment of the Dismantling Social Injustice series. You may have joined us for previous events. In this series, we've covered issues such as mental health, urban policy, equal and civil rights for the transgender community. If so, welcome back. If this is your first time with us, welcome and thank you for joining this conversation. Our goal is to continue fostering important dialogue through events like these. In today's installment, special guest Fatima Smith, a social mom entrepreneur and advisor at the, Ron, the Rise Journey, and Deron Anderson, a clinical father engagement specialist and author of Daddy's Green Book, will discuss the generational and historical influences on Black parenting. You'll hear how these structures have evolved and firsthand account of where they're headed. So we can just go over some quick event guidelines. This event is recorded. However, everyone's video is muted. So you will not be on screen. Your audio is also not going to be available. We want this to be a two-sided conversation. So if you have questions about anything we're talking about, you can go ahead and drop those in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The chat will be disabled, but there's another icon that says Q&A and you can drop your questions right there. Closed captioning is available. To turn it on, click the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preferences. All right, so we are smack in the middle of our five minute introduction. And then we'll have a 40 minute fireside chat with Fatima and Duran. From there, we will get into your questions. So um, let's hear a little bit more about our panelist. Fatima Smith is a social mom entrepreneur, and I would love to hear more about your experiences and what exactly that means. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be in community with you all. So I heard a lot growing up the term entrepreneur and social entrepreneur. And because I am a mom, it quickly changed how I saw the world and how I wanted to engage with the world. And so everything now that I'm doing is to make the community better for my child and other children. So hence the word social mom entrepreneur. Um, so it's a play on social entrepreneur. And I'm a black woman unapologetically. I am a mother, as I said, I'm a wife, I'm a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And the weight of my heart is bourbon and good wine. I love me some hip hop and R&B. And I'm just excited to have this conversation, um, particularly because we're talking about the positive. Um, and a lot of times we are focusing on like the things that are wrong within the black community, but I love being able to center um, black joy. Fantastic, we are so happy to have you. And Deron, we know you're from LA, you're an author. What else can you tell us about yourself before we get started? Well, I'm not in LA, but I'm from LA. Um, LA is still in me. You know, I tried to get it out, but it, you know, what? what's the song? What Ice Cube say? You can take the, the, the man at the hood. You can't, you can take the man at the hood, but you can't take the hood at the homeboy, something like that. It's one <laughs> old school rap, something like that. So, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I just, I rep it the best way I can. Um, again, like everybody, like Miss uh, King said, my name is Deron Anderson. I am the clinical father engagement specialist for uh, Green Green Book Therapy. And there, I provide uh, mental health services and uh, parent coaching, specifically for for fathers who are involved in the child welfare system (CPS). I've been married going on now. I say fourteen years, but my wife you know, says uh, 12, so I'm two years out. Some Two years got lost somewhere, but <laughs> I have, let's see, three kids and I have the friendliest dog in the world named Marty. I love, I love my family. I love talking about family. One of my goals were to be paid as a father and I didn't know that that can happen and it is happening. I enjoy my work, I enjoy what I do. So let's get it, let's go. I love it. And I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Just want to throw that out there. There you go. 
we, we, we've already talked about how I could not pledge Divine Nine and I hold uh, a mild level of envy, but it's okay. Um, there's, there's still room out there, you know, there, there's plenty there of space, is space out there. space for all of us. Yes, yes. All right, so I think we should jump in with someone, something that a lot of people might be wondering. What elements of parenting is unique to Black families and why are we having a conversation specifically about the evolution of Black parenthood. Deron, do you want to jump in and start us off with the how and the why? Hmm. I would say, in the Black community, there's, there's certain things that we, we actually have to worry about or be concerned about that others do not, right? You know. Um, for example, we talked about a little earlier, our safety, right? Safety in, in the black community. There are certain things that uh, I speak about as, as a father to, to, to my children about their safety, like police brutality, you know, walking down the street, especially being from LA, right? There's certain, <laughs> there's certain, uh, certain things that you have to watch out for, you have to be aware of. And those are some of the things that I don't think a lot of people have to go over in their in their families, you know, like, you know, like the black family. Uh, what, what are you wearing? How are you behaving? What, you know, what does your hair look like? You know, you know, how, what, what is the expression on your face? You know, what does that look like, you know, to, to, to police officers, you know, if, if you get pulled over, you know, are you looking intimidated, you know? And one thing I do remind my daughter, especially my daughter, because she's the oldest, I have to explain to my daughter that if she gets, if she ever gets approached by a police officer, I have to kind of inform her, talk to the police officer like you were talking to me, right? Just that's a, the easiest way that I can explain it to her because it's really hard to do that to our children, you know, because they look at, you know, the police officers or they look at when they go outside as, hey, this is a free world. I should be able to do whatever I want to do, especially as a 10 year old or a six year old. So um, that's, that's probably like one of the, for me, as a as a father, as a as a parent, as a black father, that's probably one of the most important, probably top three important things that I really have to really discuss. That's unique in the in black families. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my son's twelve and he's taller than I am, so it, <laughs> it, it, it's a lot to teach them so fast because the the world doesn't necessarily see them the way they see themselves or even how we see them. Mm -hmm. uh, Fatima, do you have anything else to share about unique elements of Black parents parenting and why it is a discussion that we're having today? Yeah, so I want to echo what Duran said. I think that's really important to talk about safety um, as far as police brutality. I also think about safety just in school. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I think of Monique Morris's push out the criminalization of black girlhood or um, Dr. Nishan Battle's um, criminalization of black girlhood, um, really talking about the school to confinement pathways um, and systems that were meant to be, well, systems that non-black folks see as helpful can actually be harmful to our Black children. And so how do we have conversations about safety in school of like, unfortunately, a lot of times you don't have the luxury of acting out the same way as your white peers may have. Um, and to Duran's point uh, and, and um, Ariane's point about your 12 year old son, they, they get to a place where they are cute little black boys and then they become scary black men, right? And so helping our children understand, or if they're they're black girls, um, having the conversation of like, oh, you're a cute little black girl. And then all of a sudden you become this like video vixen and hyper-sexualized this Jezebel. Um, so helping them navigate the narratives that are being imposed on them while they're also trying to develop a sense of self. Um, it's a lot. And then my experience with this conversation is about that generational trauma. And so in parenting, I'm trying to unlearn some of this stuff and then relearn how to do it in a way that doesn't create generational curses. And even, and even to, do you mind, I mean, I'm not sure how this goes, but this is up in. <laughs> You said, okay, we had a conversation before this. Remember we talked about it, right? 
Hey, you got it. <laughs> so what, what thing I just want to add to, to what both of us just said. Now, although it's unique, we're talking about safety and you know, in, in the street, safety, police brutality, safety, you know, in schools, right? I want to add that although these are concerns, it also make black families stronger, right? More more aware of really what's really right. going on, right? And and that kind of forces us. Um, uh, to to grow up faster than what we should be, right? It forces us to look at things so much differently. You know, I have I have my neighbor. I, I say in a predominantly white neighborhood, right? It's mixed, but it's predominantly white. Mm -hmm. um, our neighbor, they tell me we don't have to talk to our kids about you know how to act around police, I mean. right? <laughs> right? Like like you know so we have this these conversation that even through even through the church you know the the way you know we talk about you know our churches but i'm not going to go there my whole point with that is you know although we we have adversities it makes it has made us stronger even through those uh what you were talking about Fatima the generational traumas right yeah. these generational traumas is although there were concerns about it look at it another way we are stronger because of it as well and I think that goes back to like the instilling of confidence within mm -hmm. um, Black families. And again, um, I just want to clarify, we're, we're generalizing, right? Like yeah. we recognize that Black people are not a monolith. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do want to like present that so <laughs> yeah. that folks aren't like, Deron and Fatima think all of the Black people are the same. No. But <laughs> generally speaking, um, I have found in generations before me, my generation and what I assume to be generations after me black is beautiful will always be something that is centered in in a black home right mm -hmm. of like every day my daughter I stand her in front of a mirror and we say I am and then she fills in the blank so it's I am beautiful I am black I'm a brown skin girl I am you know a child of God and those affirmations because like I said before I know the world that she's entering and it's not always going to love her brown skin it's not always going to see how smart um and funny she is right so to Duran's point i think there's something really beautiful about um the the way we pour into each other that confidence of like you got this and you know like ain't nothing like a black woman to hype another black woman you know what i'm saying so well <laughs> I, I think I think that's one of the beautiful things of black black parenting that we do see. So wanted to just present both sides of like mm -hmm. the the scary, but then also to expand on Duran's point about the resilience and and the positive. I like so, that word, resilient. I like that word. Hello. So talking about two sides of different elements, um, you guys both just mentioned um being parents to daughters. And I wanted to discuss the differences between Black motherhood and fatherhood and how people are um, navigating different elements of correcting generational patterns from different perspectives. Durant. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, I did the well. little church finger like. <laughs> I think that the biggest thing for me is I now therapy is starting to be a thing, right? Is there, therapy is, is starting to be a thing. Um, it's it, it's starting to be cool. I guess you can kind of go through the, uh, you know, thank Jay Z for that because he kind of seemed like for some reason nobody was talking about it until Jay Z started talking about it anyway. But in addition to that, you know, um, what I do is I provide, uh, like I said, coaching to to, to dads. Right. And but the majority of those coaching sessions are black dads. Right. So most of them never been to a therapist. Now, they don't come to me for therapy. They come to me for coaching. Right. Which is a very thin line. Right. Between coaching and, and therapy. But we get into therapy a little bit and you'd be surprised on just like, I mean, I, I've been in so many sessions where black men were crying just in front of me saying, no one ever listens to me. No one knows what's really going on. And I've and I've coached over a thousand easy fathers, right? And this, I mean, just to just to see that weight get lifted off of them, I mean that that right there, right, that right there 
kind of takes care of what answers that question of the, 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 the generational patterns, right? Generational patterns, black families, we didn't, not that I remember, go to therapy because therapy, therapy would be considered, okay, you're sick, you're weak, and no one, that, that was a no-no, right, in, in the black community. But now there's more therapists, more black therapists out there who can really relate to what's really going on in the black families. And I think that is vital, you know, just going, just having somebody, it doesn't have to be a therapist, but that's a professional, having somebody you can just say, you know what, I give up. I don't want to do this no more. I am tired. I am tired. But what happens? Watch on the news today that there's this one dad, a, a friend of my, my wife's, not, well, the, the, the mother and daughter was a friend of my wife. The dad came in, murdered both mother and father. Wow. Just, you know, and a lot has to do with things that was built without getting too, too much into it. This was on the news and everything. So it's not a secret. A lot of it is, you know, a lot, most things are being held. Right. And that goes back to the generational trauma. Just say for, in, for instance, you had a, a, a grandmother who was being, you know, who was being abused. Right. She learned to be quiet. She learned to kind of keep those emotions to herself. Don't you say anything, right? And then what, what happens is that grandmother teaches that same way to her daughter who teaches that same way to their daughter. And now we have a whole generation of emotionless, <laughs> you know, you know, families. Yeah, um, Fatina, Fatima, can you chime in? Yes. On ways that um, black mothers in particular are working to unmake some generational trauma for healthier families moving forward. Yeah, so I said I was going to remember this person's name. And of course I don't because I have mommy brain, but there is an influencer on TikTok. She's a black woman and she speaks about um, gentle parenting and what that looks like as a black woman and gentle parents, Destiny Ann. Because I, I think so. Yes, I I stand Destiny Ann, and I think we're talking about the same person. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and by and large, I agree with what what she says and does. But um, I, I teach in social work and um, higher ed, and I try to get my students to understand. I think somebody in the chat mentioned this like why are you all focusing on being black why not just focus on being a human and I think that's a a privilege right to be and also like erasure right to be able to say like oh let's not look at color but we live in a society that is based on colorism um and, and race um and that's a social construct right so it really doesn't exist in science um but I think for us as black parents to raise our children as just human and not raise them as black children or people that will grow up to be black adults. I think we would be doing a disservice to our, our children because again, that's not how the world sees them. Um, and again, I wanna emphasize, this is my experience. I'm not clumping this all to every black person's experience. For some people, there are some black people that would say like, I've never, felt that my blackness mattered, um, that I was just treated as a human. And to that, I would say, I'm, I'm glad that was your experience. It's just, it's just not mine. And want to loop back to your question, sorry, about black women unlearning um, or trying to break some of those curses, right? Was the question? Yes, okay, yeah. you're on mute, it's okay. Um, so anyway, the influencer on TikTok talking about gentle parenting. And um, one thing that I've noticed in my like black mom groups or just my conscious mom groups are a lot of people complaining about gentle parenting being very much uh, a privilege and something that's really for white parents, right? Because the ability to like sit down and be able to like pause and think about your responses and like plan out things, like that's a point of privilege to like some families. And it's not even just a black thing it's a class thing too. Like if you're working two jobs, you've got multiple kids, 
Um, and let's throw in a child with different abilities, right? Like gentle parenting is not a one size fits all. And so I think trying to figure out how to, like I said, unlearn the things that we were taught as far as like corporal punishment, like spanking your children. Um, I grew up being spanked, but I don't want anybody spanking my child. And, you know, my mom was like, so how are they going to listen? And I was like, the same way that I listened when I went to school, no one beat me when I was in school. Like it was illegal for a teacher to, when I went to school, it was illegal for a teacher to hit me, but I behaved. So this idea that like putting your hands on a child is the only way to um, have them listen. I think that, and I don't want to go too, too in, into history, but as far as like that in, internalizing the oppressor, right? Of like, this was done to me and Duran spoke to this, this was done to me. So now I'm gonna do it to you of this like rite of passage instead of like pausing to be like, wait, was that helpful? Is there a better way? Um, but again, if you haven't unpacked your own trauma, uh, I think it's harder to be in a position to do that. So I think black moms are finding our communities and Facebook, social media, um, we're normalizing that therapy is for everyone. I, I'm a social worker and I believe that everybody, even me, needs a therapist. And therapy looks different for everyone. So there's music therapy, there's yoga therapy, you know, it doesn't have to be laying on a couch. But I am just really encouraged by the amount of Black women that I know that are seeking to address their own traumas, to um, question some of the things they're doing while understanding that we're all human and we're doing the best that we can. Thank you. And you know what? You started a conversation and you were like, oh, I don't want to go too far, but that is, it, that is exactly where I want to go next. Um, Fatima, I was hoping you could talk about some historical influences on Black parenting. None of this happens in a vacuum. So how have particular experiences and um, actions impacted not only our parenting, but the parents that made us the parents we became today? Uh, so I'm going to try to start forward and then go backwards. So one of the things that I just actually spoke to my students about this week was um, why is it more common for a Black family to kick out or disregard a child who misbehaves or doesn't fall in line, so to speak, compared to white families where there, there seems to be ample chances of like, oh, you have a substance use problem, we'll send you to rehab 50 times, you know, like, you're not going to be discarded. And again, generalizations here. Um, and I brought this question up to my students because I wanted them to understand that sometimes we in the black community can be really critical of one another, um, of like, you should do better, you should be better um, because we're trying to subscribe to like the black excellence standard. But connecting to the question of historical context, not understand, that's without understanding that Historically, Black people have been intentionally marginalized. Systems have been built to oppress. And so the ability for a Black parent to say, I'm going to keep giving you chance after chance when maybe I'm living in um, assisted living, I mean, public, assisted, public assistance housing, it's illegal for me to have somebody in my house that is doing illegal things. It's not like I own my house outright where if I do wanna have somebody that's smoking marijuana, the chances of them being found out are slim to none possibly. Um, so thinking about the, the context of like many black families since the beginning of time are still in survival mode. So to ask them to, to be able to extend that could extend that grace to their, their children um, goes back to this idea of like Black people by and large doing the, the greater good, right? And the greater good doesn't afford us the opportunity to reach out because we ourselves are trying to survive. So we're not in a position to even thrive. Um, 
and help those those others. So it's like a point of privilege in that way. Historical context also, like I mentioned briefly about beating, like slavery. How were you put, kept in line when when Black folks were enslaved? It was whippings. Um, and so oftentimes um, you do the behavior that you see. It's social learning theory, right? Like I'm going to reenact what I see done. And when we talk about, um, you know, black families and, and I'm gonna pause cause I could keep going on a rant. So I'm gonna just let Duran jump in. I was listening cause I'm like, ooh, okay, teach, I'm uh ready. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I was just thinking I'm over here. I'm over here taking notes. Like oh, I, okay. I was also thinking about how like some so within some black families and Duran, you briefly mentioned the church. I was also thinking about how within black families, there's a lot of black youth who are kicked out of their homes because of their sexuality. And I want, you know, people say like, oh, black people, again, generalization, black people are homophobic. But I want to push back and say that Black people or any group of color are often um, overcompensating because they're trying to assimilate. And so the, the messaging that we have gotten from white people, like conquerors, oppressors, has been that it's white people, blonde hair, blue eyes, man and woman together, 2.5 kids. And then if you go later down in life, 2.5 kids in a white picket fence and a dog named Skip, right? And so if you don't fit into that, you are wrong. And so what do we do as, a, we're the minority, but really we're the global major, majority, but we're not gonna get into that, to that today, but we are finding ourselves trying to prepare our children for that. So if I see white people saying, gay is wrong, even though it's not, what am I then going to do? I'm going to tell my kid, hey, don't do not do that. But if you look back at um, Black culture, if you look at Indigenous culture, like um, folks that are transgender, bisexual, queer, like that is part of our lineage, our ancestry, and it was, it was embraced. It wasn't until white colonizers came in and told us any different. And so what do you do when you're being ruled? Do you you're gonna fall in line or what happens, right? We're, I we're digress. different enough. We don't we don't have any leeway to be more different than the default different. Right. And that kind of goes to the conversation I, I had with you when we did this like intro introduction conversation about like most of the time black children and black parents don't have the ability to be any other identity. It's like I'm black. Um I hear a lot of my queer friends say like when I'm around black people. I don't get to be black and queer. Um, you know, when I'm with my queer friends, I, I don't get to be black and queer, I'm just queer, right? And so really um, thinking about ways in which we create safe spaces um, and safe homes that can celebrate black joy in its full spectrum, right? Not black excellence in that you're Greek and you're got a college degree and you're a homeowner, but black excellence, um, being in, in Black Girl Magic and Black Boy Joy being um, all, all the, the things, all the classes, right? It's, it's not about um, the superficial um, labels that we're putting on, but Black excellence is, is about um, resistance, right? And resiliency. But we don't have that conversation. It gets kind of convoluted because why pop culture and social media? Okay, I digress. I don't want to have a lecture. There, there, was, there was a lot of things that you were saying. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I'm gonna just skip on them. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry, so, Duran, I have a more pointed question for you. So, you focus specifically on coaching fathers. Yes. So, um, what are some societal impacts to Black fatherhood today? And how can fathers navigate these experiences and recover from some less than ideal history? Well, that wasn't on our question sheet. He's number nine. <laughs> I'm messing with you. <laughs> <I> got... <laughs> number nine. Okay. Hi. Okay. Was it highlighted? Okay. <laughs> so uh, pretty much, um, you were asking like, what are the, the the influences of societal influences on that uh, black fathers have? Yes. That's pretty much what she's saying. Okay. I wanted to say some. My my daughter has a joke, right? She wants to be a comedian. Okay. This she wants to be a comedian, and and one of her jokes. Was, was she says, my dad, you know, he's hard on me. 
you know, he said, one day, you know, you're going to grow up and you're going to be out this house and you're going to be living on your own. And hopefully daddy has taught you everything he needs to teach you. And then he said, but sometimes, you know, daddy says he's going to kick me out early. Right. And then he's, and then he always brings up, he said, well, God kicked Adam and Eve out early for making one mistake. For testing the tree. So can my daddy kick me out of the house too? For, <laughs> so that that that's like a big deal, especially you know in, in the black community. You know, we we have the black family. I don't like to say community, but the black family. You know, we are, you know, especially dads. We are really hard. Um, we're really hard on our on our sons, but not necessarily too hard on our daughters, right? And this it, this poses a, a big uh, issue, you know, when our children grow up and get out there into society, right? Most of most of my dad most of my dads will say, well, you know what. Um, you know, I treat my son hard, right? So when he get out there, you know, he'll be tough. My response, if you're tough, most likely your son is going to be tough. He's all right. You don't need to be tough on your son. You need to love your son. You need to hug your son. You need to tell him that you love him. I said, now your daughter, your daughter needs to deal with knuckleheads like us, right? We don't prepare our daughters for what's really going, going, going on out there, right? We, we kind of, are, are the, and there's nothing wrong with creating your daughters and loving your daughters. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But to treat your children differently, to raise them. I mean, I know you treat them differently because of their personality. You have to. You can't treat all your children the same. You can't. Different personalities require different ways to communicate with your children. Right. But as far as, you know, you want to treat them hard, you want to treat them soft, you want to love them. You love your kids the same you know you give them as much love you give them equal love all around all around and i think that's one thing that we have to remember you know with black fathers right black fathers but what what i'm what i'm coaching them on is their emotions understanding their children's emotion and that's big time you know i let our, i let the dads know again you show me a child that cannot get mad in the home and i'll show you a bully yeah, those right. emotions are, are real. They're, they're, very, they're very real. And that's, I mean, these, the way we parent Black fathers, the way we parent our children is going to impact society, right? Because Whitney Houston said that she was in our future, right? <laughs> so we just had to, <laughs> so I, I'm out there and I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that there's, there's that's, that's probably, when I say the top three, that's probably the, t- the first one, helping our children understand and control and manage their emotions if they can do that then you have a child who's ready for school you have a child who's ready for school you have a child who's ready to learn you have a child who's ready to learn there's a child who's who can pretty much learn anything child who can learn anything the child who will be able to succeed at whatever they want to right so we before before we get out there before we put our kids out there we need to help them with their emotions and that's the impact that I believe that uh, the black fathers can have on their child. It can either be, it can either be dire, you know, that that kid that when they get mad they go out and they fight or they shoot somebody, or it can be a kid that learns how to express their pain properly. Yeah. So we are coming to the end. So I have a couple rapid fire questions for us, just to make sure we've hit all of the touch points. So the first one, Deron, you've already started. So I'll let you head back to it. And this question is, what topics should parents focus most on when considering their children's future? So we've already got emotional well-being on the list. What else? Uh, emotional well-being, uh, money. Be open with them and talk to them about their finances. You know, that generational wealth, that's the real thing. We have to really... You know, don't be scared to, you know, talk. You don't have to give your kids all the business, but you can't, you know, teach them little by little, you know, about finances. Um, also, their, their mental health and their physical health. This is rapid fire. I'm not sure how fast you want me to do it. <laughs> but those are like, I would say my top three, their emotions, mental health, physical health, and their finances. That is a beautiful top three. Fatima, do you have anything to add to topics that parents should focus on when considering their children's future? Sorry, um, I'm like responding to people in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> things that people should consider to help their children, is that the question? Um, yes, considering your children's future. 
Um, I'm going to have to say consent. Um, I'm a survivor of intimate partner violence and sexual assault um, as a child and as an adult. And so consent is really, really important to me. Um, and in bound, so consent, autonomy, boundaries, all of that would be my one. Um, and, and not just in the context of like intimate relationships or like stranger danger, but even just being able to learn your voice and how to, to like how to harness your voice and then use it. And I'll give the example of my three-year-old. Last night, she asked my husband for spicy noodles and he cooked them and he had just made them and he gave them to her and she took a scoop of them and she said, daddy, I asked for spicy noodles, not hot noodles. And, you know, for me, she's three and I'm like, yes, girl, like just being able to say that. And I know for some people like they're like, oh, that's trivial. But there are a lot of children, regardless of race, um, that really just to Duran's point, you know, if, if a kid can't express their emotions um, in the home, where else can they do that? And then it turns into something negative in the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Um so I think just being able to affirm our, our children. So consent, autonomy, boundaries. The, the next thing is um, affirmations. Um, I think that's really, really important to um, uh, affirm your child. And, and I don't mean just like saying good job to everything, but like recognizing like, oh, you tried. Like, thank you for making that effort. Um, that's not exactly correct. Here's why, but like, it's still encouragement and it's mm -hmm. not so much focused on like what they did or didn't do. And the reason I say that is because for me, I'm trying to unlearn that with my child of like, because you're black, you have to be twice as good. Right. Like I want to make sure that my daughter, you know, does well because she wants to do well and that she can do well and not this like external imaginary pressure, um, to do that. And then, um, the last one just escaped me. So I don't know my three, but those will be my two things um, that I guess I will say to focus on. It's affirmations, consent, boundaries, autonomy. And if I think education. of the other one, I'll, huh? Education. As far as like focusing on education? Mm -hmm. I, yes, I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I thought you affirm, mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, I can affirm um, education as well. Um, but I, there was something I wanted. Um, Let us know if you find it. We're not going anywhere just yet. Yeah, I'm like, I um, can't think of it. <laughs> we have gotten to hear um, little tidbits from what you are both working on, but I would love to give you guys the stage for a moment and just share how you guys are helping Black families flourish in your everyday life. Duran? Mm, well, um, I... I love my family um, and my family is perfect to me. Okay. And I think that's what's definitely important. So when, when I, when I coach dads and this, that's what I do. I coach dads and also I provide, I have, I started a program. Well, I charted a program at my children's school. It's called all pro dads. And it just kind of encourages uh, dads to, to be more involved in their children's education. Right. So and, and I encourage dads to, you know, to do that, be involved in your child's education, whether it's the PTA, whether it's your own program that you're, you know, you're being a part of. Um, also, I, I do mental health therapy, you know, and I I work with moms as well, but I rather work with dads. Um, moms, they um, they have a. a they have, it, it's, it's something that I don't really feel as confident in doing be, um, because I just, I just don't. I, I will do it, I do my study, I do my research, um, but I, I rather work with dads. So as many dads as I can, you know, I wrote Daddy's Green Book, not for daddies, right? Not for dads, most people think I wrote that book for dads. No, dads has been doing everything in that book for years. Okay, then you have to explain Daddy's Green Book to us okay. because I totally thought it was a handbook for dads. Well, that, that's what most people think, but Daddy's Green Book is just so uh, fatherhood in its simplicity, right? Um, fatherhood does not have to be 
hard, right? Just, you know, spend time, daddy's play. And, and it's a book uh, geared towards uh, ages zero to five, but zero to 100 can really relate to everything in that book. So it's like hidden meanings, like daddy's read, right? Daddy's, daddy's pray, daddy's cry, daddy's, you know, everything daddy's do and been doing. But that's most that's mostly for people who don't know we've been doing this, right? Most of us, we focus on, you know, what daddies aren't doing. I, daddy, that be that, that be this, that be that. So I decided to, you know, write a book for everyone, but it was focused, it was for dads. I mean, it was, it was written on behalf of dads for everyone to see that we the bomb, right? And we, we've been doing this and there's some good dads uh, <laughs> out there. And I'm also creating the training for families. I do training for, you know, for schools and it's based off the daddy's green book, the importance of literacy, the importance of play, the importance of having an imagination, right? Encouraging families, encouraging fathers to play, you know, um, pretend with their kid, you know, put on a ninja outfit, you know, and can pretend because that imagination, that's ours. We can go anywhere. Right. <laughs> we could go anywhere and discover any all types of worlds. So I definitely encourage fun, love yeah. and fun. That's what I'm all about. That is epic. And Fatima, can you share a little bit about what you're doing in your everyday life to help Black families flourish? Yeah. So one way is I have a nonprofit called Collective 365 and we give grant funding and provide capacity building opportunities for individuals, groups, businesses, and nonprofits who are doing work with and for black and brown communities in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And so some people might be like, well, that's not specifically black families, but for me, black families um, doesn't have to be mom, dad, like I said, 2.5 kids and a dog. Um, it's chosen family, right? Like the people that we are, have the ability to choose who we say our family. Um, it is um, understanding that the child that does that is not embraced by the village will set the village on fire to feel its warmth. That's an African proverb. And so my hope with Collective 365 is to provide um, a platform that allows black people, black and brown people to be decision makers and thought leaders. Um, in their own communities, because a person that can describe a problem can also describe a solution. They just need time, space, and resources. So what are we doing as a community to celebrate and invest in those communities? Then more on a micro level, like one-on-one, -on -one, I do workshops um, about consent. Um, I have conversations about parenting while healing. So like I said before, I'm a survivor of childhood domestic violence, which means that I grew up in a home with domestic violence, but I didn't I wasn't the recipient of the abuse. And then I was sexually assaulted as a, as a child and then in an abusive relationship while in grad school. And so those experiences certainly frame how I see the world um, and how I engage with the world, but it's not the only way that I want the world to see me. And so I'm still processing my own stuff and then I'm responsible for this beautiful life um, that's three years old, right? And some of the things that I have experienced trying to obviously want better for her and also recognizing that, you know, I am going to give her as much as I, I can and, you know, realizing that, you know, abuse can only end when the, the abuser stops abusing, right? Um, so, so how, how to navigate all in unlearning and learning. So that's um, ways in which I support um, black families and just families in general, it doesn't have to be black specifically. Perfect, so it is time for our Q and A. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions. We are still here. If you have something that you'd like to ask, jumping right in, Brittany asked, can you share any thoughts for white parents of mixed race children in navigating these conversations? Duran, I'm gonna pick on you, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I do not have any experiences, but um, what I can say is, um, 
just pay attention to your child. Just, just pay attention to you know what they're saying. Pay attention to um, their needs. I, I, <laughs> okay, they remember I told you before that um, I might say things that might get me in trouble, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. All right. So just <laughs> you see, you see that I told you, right? <laughs> but I, I would say. You know, try to find a black friend, you know, that that can actually help you, you know, with um, it depends on you said a, a mixed kid that and just try to find as many, you know, mixed uh, um, couples or mixed families as you can. I do not um, have a lot of experience with that. Um, that's just off the top, um, but uh, Fatima I'm, might have something else. I'm gonna help you out. Are you trying to encourage exposure to diverse Okay, cultures? okay, yeah. I'm not gonna, li li listen, if I don't know it, I'm gonna say I don't have experience with it, but I'll still share, you know, what I think. I'm not, I'm not that person, you know, yeah. so there we go. Um, so the question was advice for white parents raising biracial children? Correct. Yeah. Um, I am not white raising a biracial child. Um, I have had conversations with biracial um, children and what I have heard from my friends is that they just wish that race was talked about instead of ignored in their house. Um, it, it wasn't, when I say ignored, like people obviously saw that, that the kid was of color. But as far as to our point earlier about having conversations about how some people may other you and some people may not. And um, just being open to having those conversations. So like some of my biracial friends said that if they would bring up that they had experienced racism, their parent would almost make it about them. And so it made it hard for them to be able to process their feelings because one, they were either having to educate their parent about it or two, comfort their parent about it. And so, but I think that's a rule with anything. Like as parents, we don't wanna see our children hurting. And so being able to kind of um, check our emotions so that we can provide space for our kids. Great, so. Deron, we have a question for you. Specifically. Get me in trouble. What did, what did I do this time? I, I, <laughs> you requested. I'm Let's so go. Sorry. Let's go. What advice can you give to someone who recognizes the benefits of therapy but has a partner who's adverse or fearful of the idea? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, what advice? I would. I would actually, you know, just say, you know, participate. You know, first time, you know, anyone ever. First of all, it's like you you have steps. First is I don't want therapy. Then it's uh, it might be okay to uh, are you doing it? No, I, I'm not doing it. So I would say when you get into that, you know, walk with them. You know, hold their hand through it. You know, sometimes people don't have to go through therapy by themselves the first time. You know, there there's there's multiple types of therapy. Most people think therapy is sitting on a couch. And, you know, and say, hey, my problem is this. No, <laughs> therapy, I mean, there's therapists that, that do that, you know, but there, there are also therapists that do, you have uh, yoga, you know, you have, what do you call that, hot steam? Like, like me personally, I'm, I'm actually starting something that's called Better Than Yesterday. And this is for in, um, children that who are, um, foster children who are transitioning out of, um, out of foster care into adulthood. And the type of therapy that I'm gonna to bring to them would be um, fitness, right? So they'll come to the gym and then we'll just talk about whatever they wanna talk about, right? You know, so most people are like, well, I don't, you can do that? Yes, that's therapy. So you wanna find the therapy that fits you. Okay, there we go. There's therapy for everybody somewhere. Every somewhere. Great. So someone, uh, Miera asked, Fatima mentioned that some things people might consider helpful might actually be harmful to the Black community. Could you please elaborate on what those things might be? I messaged her. So uh, do you want to skip to somebody that I didn't message? Mm -hmm. Hold on, hold on. 
Yeah, I can't tell who you messaged. I have so okay, I'll questions. tell you some questions that I can see that I would love. Uh, have we discussed the ownership of Black families? When do we take back ownership of our Black families and move away from social services? Ooh. Fatima, we're still on you. Do you have any thoughts on that question? Um, I think, so I do have thoughts. Um, I think that by and large, no one wants to be dependent on anybody. That's regardless of race. Like I think all of us have a vision of what a good life is and that's gonna vary. But most of us, you know, we just want our basic needs met and maybe a little something extra on the side. Um, but I think this um, idea that black families are dependent on social services, I think is a false narrative. I think we need to take a step back, bird's eye view of why people engage with social services. Historically, social services have been run by white, cisgender, heterosexual women. Um, and when they are coming into contact with families of color, Black, Latinx, Asian, um, they're often not in a position to exercise cultural humility. And so the things that, and so somebody asked the question of like, why do you keep talking about Black parenting? Um, you know, they're not, it, we're all just parents. Um, lady, I would love, or sir, they, whoever you are, I would love to say that that is true. But as a social worker who has studied this and has worked in systems, um, that's not the case. There is racial bias um, that has been studied. Um, I think it was in Pennsylvania where there was a extreme high rate of black and brown kids being um, put into the system, having unnecessary contact with social services. And it was just because of a difference of personal values, right? It wasn't that they were actually doing anything to cause harm or neglect or abuse to the child. It was just, well, I didn't like that they didn't have fresh vegetables. Not everybody eats fresh vegetables. Like that, I mean, that doesn't mean that they're malnourished, right? Um, so long answer, sorry, to answer, when are we gonna get away from that? I would say, when are we gonna, you know, defund social services, just like there's a call to defund police. I mean, and I might be too radical for this conversation, but I, I think the same energy that we have with defunding the police should be to defund uh, social services because I am not always sure that they are doing. And so that other question earlier of like an, an example of a system that's meant to help, but is harmful, that would be one of those systems. Um, so when we look at it, it's like on face value, child protective services, let's help children. But research is telling us that we are causing more harm than good. And so until systems can be dismantled and rebuilt, um, until they can center the people that they're supposed to be um, helping most, I think you're going to continue to see disproportionate rates of Black and Brown people um, engaging in those services. Um, so I think we might be able to fit in two more questions. So Mel asked, how do we help children not feel othered, especially adopted and fostered youth? Deron. Oh, oh hey, Fatima. Yeah. No, I just answered them. I just put yeah. affirmations and representation. Okay. Totally agree. Can, can, I, can I address something really, really quick? Of course. There's been a few people in the comments that have been saying things like, can we talk about, um, intergroup um, trauma. So like how there's colorism, like dark versus light. And so some people may not be experiencing like racism, but they're experiencing colorism. Um, and I think I briefly touched on this, but I just keep seeing it in the chat. So I just want to like drive home the point that um, yes, that is definitely happening. And my take on that, my school of thought is that it comes from the mirroring of white America. And so you see that in any um, place that has been colonized. So if you go to Puerto Rico, like light-skinned Puerto Ricans don't particularly care for dark-skinned Puerto Ricans. If you go to places in um, countries in Africa, you will see 
um, skin whitening products. You'll see that in, in places in Asia. Um, so that is a byproduct of colonization and oppression. Um, and it's very real. And I think they're, they're, that also causes some division, right? Because you're telling your child, like, you're Black, you're beautiful. But then when you, and my personal experience was that, you know, I was fair skinned, that I was much lighter than this. And my hair was kind of like reddish blonde when I was a little kid. Um, and so, and I, we lived in New York. And so literally people would walk up to my parents who were darker than me and say like, whose child is that? Or did you dye her hair? Um, and black people for a good portion of my life were the meanest to me um, because the way I talked, the way I looked, you know, oh, you think you're cute. No, you think I'm cute. Um, that's, that's a you problem, not a me problem, right? Uh, um, but I think to the comments in the chat, like we don't always make space for that. We, um, but I think it's again about that privilege, right? Like there's just so many, um, and, that, and this goes back to like intersectionality. There's just so many systems at play that it, it gets to a point where it's like, okay, what are we gonna tackle first? What do we have the bandwidth? to address today. But I did want to name that just because I saw that a lot in the chat. Definitely, thank you. I do want to slip in one more question. This was actually really sweet. Um, Deron, the question is, what would you say are the main things that you'd love to see in picture books or visuals for children? What do we see black families and community? Let's see black families. I, I would like to see, that, that's crazy because I wrote something down on that. I would like to see uh, shared parenting. Right, I would like to see both parents, mom, dad, 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 mom, mom, whomever. I want. I would like to see them both doing something. One's working, one's cleaning the kitchen, one's picking up the kids. What shared parenting? I would just. I, I think it's important that uh, children needs to see that. You know, dad just don't go out and work, and that's all. Like for example, I make breakfast and lunch every single morning for the past ten years for my daughters and for my children, right? My wife, she makes dinner, shared. She works, she's a professional, I work. So to see that, that will be so beautiful because that teaches our children that, hey, you know what I mean? That, you know, it, there, there is no, um, there is no, what was, was, help me off with Tima, there is no, ah, There are no gender roles? Right, everything is fair, right? Everything is fair, everything is equal. I love that. And and to add on to that, you know, one of the things that I brought up in our prep was like, you know, we are talking from a very binary standpoint of like mom and dad. And I do want to recognize that there are, and I love to see this, an increase of same gender couples raising children um, and, and their experiences are different. And so to whomever is asking questions about books, um, being able to, to show like single parents and that that's not a problem because I know a lot of black women who are making the conscious decision to have children without a partner. Um, and so I think to Duran's point, just being able to um, have representation um, and changing, not even changing the narrative, but taking control of the narrative because um, who, who was it? Um, Tell me the person that said, if you don't write your story, they'll write it for you and, and, and make it seem like you loved it. Ah, oh, who said that? It's a black woman who said it. I, I don't know, know, but I also must say that we are unfortunately out of time. I do have a little bit of housekeeping, but I cannot thank you both enough for joining us today, Fatima and Duran. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for sharing your time and your advice with us. I will be putting the links to all of their contact information in the chat so that you guys can see them, um, connect with Fatima and Duran, and continue to get more of their fantastic advice. Um, before we go, I'd like to share a few slides. All right. Find others who share your interest and save 30% on your first meetup organizer subscription. Go to meetupsavings.com. We've also launched a podcast with Meetup's very own CEO, David Siegel. Please take a moment to take out your phone right now on the screen 
scan the QR code or screenshot it if you are watching from your mobile device and you can access Meetup's Keep Connected podcast. And as a reminder, you can view a recap of this event in a few days on our community, community matters blog at meetup.com forward slash blog. Thank you for joining us and stay safe, everyone. Have a great night.